everybody, Peter Zine here coming to you from Colorado. It is the 29th of January, and the news today is that in a drone attack, a Iranian militia operating near the border of Jordan and Syria managed to get a drone into an American base uh, and kill three people in the vicinity of one of the barracks. These are the, the first deaths of American military personnel since uh, the Iranians started pushing groups like the Houthis to attack Americans and international commerce in a large volume, and it's probably going to merit a response. Uh, something to keep in mind uh, is when the United States a couple weeks ago decided to start taking military action against the Houthis in Yemen, it wasn't because uh, these Iranian-backed groups were attacking commerce in general. It's because they fired an anti-ship missile at a U.S. military vessel, and that's what started it all off. So working from that same logic, now that some Americans have actually died, you can expect the Biden administration to strike back. The question is how? Uh, there's kind of three things to consider. Uh, none of the options are great. Option number one, you do a semi-proportionate, because the Americans always believe in overkill, assault against the militias that Iran backs either in the area in question or somewhere in the broader Middle East. Uh, the problem with this is it doesn't solve the problem. The people who are doing the attacks aren't Iranian. They're just using Iranian equipment and sometimes a little bit of Iranian intel. And even if you were to wipe them all out, they come from sectarian groups who are opposed to their local geopolitical orders. And so they tend to oppose uh, Sunni groups who tend to be in the majority, especially in places like Jordan or um, in the case of uh, Iraq, where you have a pseudo democracy. Uh, and in these cases, even if you were to take them all out, you just have an aggrieved minority that would, again, push people in that the Iranians would uh, recruit. So it might make things calm down for a few weeks to months, but it's certainly not any sort of lasting solution that's going to change the logic in Tehran at all. Uh, the second option is to strike military assets in Iran proper. The idea is you go after the personnel that are making these decisions. The problem here is that there's a lot of them. Um, Iran isn't like most strongman autocracies. You've got a ruling elite of the religious the class, the mullahs, who's over 10,000 people. And even if you were to somehow magically carry out an assassination program and within 24 hours kill the top thousand of them, I mean, sure, they'd have some reshuffling, uh, but it actually wouldn't disrupt the regime in any meaningful way. In addition, Iran is a series of mountains. It's basically a fortress. And if you wanted to go in there and knock the government out, you would need a force significantly larger than what the United States pushed into Iraq, which is ultimately a flat and somewhat desert community. Uh, and that means you're going over mountain range and mountain range and mountain range. So you're, the distances are far. The logistics would be hard. The geography plays to the defender's strength. And then even if you were successful, well, then what? Are you going to stick around and try to reconstruct Iran? Uh, in the way that we did Iraq, I think I think the U.S. learned that that's not an easy thing to do. So, uh, and again, this wouldn't change any of the logic in Iran about what they're doing in the broader region. If anything, would it intensify it? Uh, that leaves us with the third option, which is a military option against Iran's economy. Now, Iran, while it is nowhere near the peak that it once was back in the 70s as an oil producer, when it was exporting more than 4 million barrels a day, uh, is still in the game, still exports about a million barrels a day, and that income is the primary source of hard currency that the Iranians use to fund everything that they do, from purchasing social stability from their population at home to funding these rocket attacks against U.S. military targets throughout the broader region. Uh, and unfortunately for the Iranians, it all flows through a single point called Karg Island, which is on the northeast shore of the Persian Gulf. And it would be very, very, very easy for the United States just to destroy the loading facilities or maybe even the storage tanks and the pumping stations uh, in Karg. They could probably do it with a handful of sorties. It would probably take less than an hour. Uh, Iranian missile defense is, uh, is not very good. Their air defense is not very good either. And the U.S. obviously is very good at striking in those sorts of conditions, especially when you're talking about something that is on the coast so you don't have to fly over too many defensive layers to get to it. There'd be a cost to this, of course. Should the United States decide to do this step, it would take the role of the erstwhile global guarantor of maritime security and have the United States taking very discreet shots at very specific parts of the global economy that have relied upon international security in order to function. And that means that any vessels that are part of a long supply chain, a long sail, going through a dangerous area, near a dangerous area, 
uh, or have multiple supply chain steps, meaning that if you interrupt just one of them, all of them become defunct, uh, all of that would be in danger. And that is the entire electronic supply chain in Southeast Asia and East Asia. That is the entire oil supply chain, which either is sourced from or passes through the Middle East. The consequences of that would be significant on a global basis. But if you want to take the American populist view, which is something that Biden and Trump agree on, is that a lot of that doesn't really matter. And in fact, there's something to be said for stalling those international systems because they favor North American solutions. The United States doesn't get energy from this region anymore. Canada doesn't. Mexico cut doesn't. So the economies that we care about the most are heavily insulated already. And the economy that we're most dependent upon or the most concerned about is China. And they get all of their energy from this region. Well, not all, but like half. And so if the Biden administration does take this step, things will very much be in motion very quickly. Europe's river systems are not integrated, and the differences that fact spawns do not end with different languages and identities. French trade travels on French rivers with French profits deposited in French banks where they are used to further French goals. Rivers, trade, and banks are all considered national assets. As one would expect from any such national asset, the banks' responsibilities are first and foremost to look out for the interests of the state. In 1992, the Europeans may have committed themselves to launching the Euro era, but they never united their disparate financial and banking systems into a cohesive whole. That split is the root of the European financial crisis. Once again, it comes down to the balance of transport, but this time from an economic rather than a strategic point of view. The balance of transport isn't easily swayed by political agreements, even ones as potent and far-reaching as Bretton Woods. The NEP remained the economic hub of the European wheel. But not everyone in Europe had rivers, and so not everyone in Europe could generate the surplus capital that made everything from infrastructure to education possible. Geographically less endowed areas like Iberia, southern Italy, and Greece were perennial laggards. European structural adjustment monies poured into these areas to help close the gap, funding everything from highways to olive groves. But the capacity created by this assistance couldn't hope to keep up with what the richer portions of Europe invested into their home systems simply as a matter of course. On anything remotely resembling a level playing field, well-rivered, flat, and integrated Northern Europe would always be more thoroughly educated and more productive and richer than highland, arid, and disconnected Southern Europe. But in a common monetary system, capital could flow nonetheless. Currency unity meant that the surplus capital generated in the North could be lent out to southern economies that had no experience using it wisely at rates normally reserved for countries like Germany. Currency unity meant that northern European exporters had unrestricted access into southern economies that couldn't hope to compete with the northerners' superior infrastructure and workforces. The result was the buildup of mountains of debt among southern economies, consumers, and governments at the same time that the hollowing out of southern economies made it impossible for the debt to be paid back. Far from being the crowning achievement of United Europe, the euro was guaranteed from day one to destroy it. The ensuing calamity was as harsh as it was predictable. Less than a decade after the euro's 1999 launch, all it took was a recession to crack the finances of many countries to pieces. The now infamous bailouts of Greece and Ireland, and the less notorious bailouts of Latvia, Portugal, Hungary, Cyprus, Romania, and Spain, have as of February 2014 collectively totaled over 600 billion euros in funds transfers and write-offs. At the time of this writing, the Europeans are not quite to the point that they can admit to the inanity of the euro. Most serious efforts are still focused on helping a broken system limp along. Unfortunately, Europe's corporate, government, and consumer debt crisis is only one of seven challenges that the Europeans face, and it is probably their most manageable. The European financial crisis has had many economic impacts, but the results have been worst in banking. Because the Europeans see banking as a national prerogative, Concerns such as national infrastructure needs, maximum employment, and government budgetary stability are tossed into the mix of bankers' concerns, right along with concerns of collateral and profitability. This is encouraged, 
and oftentimes actually required Europe's banks to put national directives above corporate decision making, particularly on topics like due diligence. This enables European governments to use their banks as a means of speeding investment in this or that targeted sector, to construct or repair infrastructure sooner than if they had to raise capital from private sources or taxes, or to help maintain governmental budgets in times of stress by simply directing the banks to invest in government bonds. Unsurprisingly, many of Europe's banks are state-owned in majority, or in part, and even those that are not are often used as slush funds for various political interests at the local, regional, and or national level. In essence, the various governments see the financial sector as a tool of governance and use it as such. An excellent example is that of Belgian French bank Dexia. Many Belgian communities purchased shares in the bank to ensure that they would always have a strong private demand for their local debt. If a private corporation had done something similar, it would have been illegal in Europe and the United States as an antitrust violation. As the European financial crisis deepened in 2008, it became obvious that investors were shunning the bonds of highly indebted governments, such as Belgium, where the national debt was rapidly approaching the country's total GDP. Dexia did not join the exodus. Far from it. Its owners, Belgian government entities, directed Dexia to purchase even more Belgian debt. As the financial crisis proceeded, Dexia assets soured, especially its government debt. The bank ran out of operating capital, and in September 2008, it was forced to apply for bailout assistance. The bank's assets were so overvalued and its operating capital so negative that it cost taxpayers 6 billion euros over two bailouts to close the thing down. As regards geopolitics, this has two inevitable outcomes. First, in Europe, finance writ large is state-directed rather than market-directed. That maximizes the presence of the state-linked banks in the broader system, while minimizing the involvement of non-government financial sectors such as stock markets and corporate bonds. This is the opposite of the American system, where finance is somewhat agnostic and government's involvement in the sector is normally limited to regulatory matters. Consequently, approximately 70% of all private credit in Europe is obtained from banks, while in the United States it is the faceless stock markets that generate fully half of all credit, with banks playing only a supporting role. The second outcome of this bank-centric system is that when Europe suffers from a recession, its bank's highest priority is to keep governments functioning. That means they must double down on financing government deficits. Couple a financial crisis with a recession, and banks simply have no resources remaining to lend to businesses and consumers. This means that until Europe can rectify the financial imbalances the euro has caused, any growth in Europe must occur without more than middling participation from its banking sector, a sector that controls nearly all of the system's available credit. That would be bad enough if everyone involved still agreed what the goal of a united Europe was. That, alas, is a degree of unity that no longer exists. The European Union and its predecessor, the European Economic Community, has always been a strange animal. Any organization that was formed in the early years of Bretton Woods was going to have an economic underpinning considerably different from the previous era, and in this the EU did not disappoint. But more than an economic grouping designed to take full advantage of the security and trade network the Americans had created, the EEC and EU ultimately had a political rationale. That rationale belonged to Paris. While France had always been near the top of the European pile, it had only rarely been actually on top. And even when it was during the Napoleonic era, the other European powers ruthlessly tore it down from its perch. After Napoleon's fall from grace, France refounded itself and attempted to resume its position as the premier European power. It never made it. The British stymied the French in the wider world just as the Prussians did within Europe. And in 1871, Paris found itself not simply under German occupation, but being forced to cede territory and the authority to manipulate Central European affairs to Berlin. The rest of the story includes French devastation in the World Wars. But the American forged security arrangements of the post-World War II era provided Paris with some interesting opportunities. Austria had been split off from Germany, and both had been parceled up and occupied. Italy was cast adrift. The British had gone home. 
The Iberians and Turks had skipped the war and were languishing under their own local authoritarian governments. The Russians loomed large, but rather than manipulate European events, they had drawn the Iron Curtain and were busy digesting Central and Eastern Europe. The only truly involved powers on the continent were the Low Countries of the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, a trio that could not resist French power without considerable assistance, and there was no assistance to be found. And so the French launched the European integration process. I use quotes there because the initial goal very clearly was not to create a truly European system, but to band together countries that the French could dominate into a grouping that the French would dominate. The Low Countries were weak, Italy was a mess, Germany was divided, occupied in part by France, and its opinion was neither allowed nor issued. After over a century of coming in second or worse in the European game, France finally reigned supreme. For the next two generations, German industrial profits were funneled via the EU budget to fund French national and geopolitical goals. France was able to count upon Germany to back any position Paris wanted to stake out, and the two NEP heavyweights were able to impose French desires upon the rest of the Union. But the gravy train couldn't last forever. In time, the artificial circumstances of the Cold War ended, the Iron Curtain collapsed, and the Central European states joined the EU in the 2000s. All of them remembered what French security guarantees had meant in the run-up to World War II, and so were not willing to sign away their newfound independence to a French-dominated institution. Sweden and Finland, fiercely independent from decades of resisting the Soviets without the NATO umbrella, joined in 1995 and were not interested in being springboards for French ambition. France no longer automatically got its way, but with the Germans' reflexive silent partners, Paris could still fairly easily forge ad hoc coalitions to get whatever it wanted. Then, in 2008, a process that had begun 20 years earlier culminated in disaster for Paris. In 1989, the Cold War ended. In 1993, Germany began the reunification process, which was completed in 2003. And then in 2008, the Germans elected a two-party coalition led by politicians unencumbered by any connection to wartime or Cold War German politics. These new German politicians still saw themselves as allied with France, but no longer beholden to it. The days of Paris telling the Germans what the German position was were over. France and Germany are still partners, allies even, but the relationship is thinning. By far the biggest point of disagreement is on union control. The Germans are still willing to foot the bill for a united Europe, bailouts and all, but now they want a few things in exchange for their commitment. They want reforms to be hardwired into EU treaty law, and even the constitutions of the EU members that will outlaw budget deficits. They want approval of national budgets to be the responsibility of EU institutions, institutions that are beholden to German norms. Collectively, these reforms would lock all of the European countries into how the Germans do things. And since many of the weaker states are weaker because of geography, they would become permanently servile to German supply chains and financial might. In essence, the Germans want to use German money to solidify German control of the European system. And the Germans have the gall to insist that France is not exempt. The French, in contrast, want to go back to how things were before 2008, back to the era of French exceptionalism and control. They want the Germans to keep paying to keep the EU afloat, but to do so without significant changes in how it operates, and certainly how France operates. They want budgetary control to remain at the national level and for deficit restrictions to remain somewhat loose. They want to keep getting financial transfers from Germany, even though France is one of the Union's richest members. In essence, they want to reachieve what they once had, to use German money to support French control of the European system. Until and unless the French and Germans can close ranks, everything else about the European Union degrades into near pointlessness. The EU hasn't enacted a meaningful foreign policy stance since the financial breakdown of 2007. Critical needs such as a banking union have been negotiated due to French insistence, but not armed with the money or authority required to make them functional due to German insistence. Bailouts have been awarded, as Berlin realizes they must, but the terms have been so constantly abrogated that the weaker countries, often due to French intervention, 
have been able to enjoy a revolving door of fresh credits. This furious running in place will last until the Franco-German relationship heals. The Franco-German disconnect would be bad enough if German money were sufficient to fix the European system, but it isn't. There are three routes a country can take to economic growth. Consumption-led, export-led, and investment-led. Germany in the 2010s is very similar to the Germany of the late 19th century in that it is an investment and export-led system. Most German capital is poured into its industrial base and educational system, leaving little money in the hands of the people to spend. This was a wonderful model for the Germans in the 2000s. The unity of the Eurozone allowed all of the Europeans, and in particular Southern Europeans, to access German credit to finance the purchase of German goods. Also, Europe, and in particular Southern Europe, had a demographic hot-wired for mass consumption. But that was then. What is rapidly taking root in Europe is a near-perfect storm of economic challenges. The countries that face the most systemic financial pressure, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and Italy, are among the most rapidly aging European states. Of the danger states, only Spain still has a bulge in its population profile that is under 40, and even they are already in their late 30s. Consumption-led growth in Southern Europe is now largely impossible. For Germany and other heavily technocratic European states like Finland and the Netherlands, their development policy combined with a lack of young people means that a local consumption-driven model hasn't been possible for 20 years. And with no replacement generation growing into adulthood, such a model cannot be returned to within the next 30 years. Aggressive German exports limited industrial expansion across Southern Europe, meaning fewer local jobs for the few 20 and 30-somethings who remained. Southern Europe was never competitive with Germany in the first place. Now, with all of Southern Europe in the Eurozone, these countries cannot devalue their currencies to compete on cost. Southern Europe cannot have export-led growth. The aging of Europe across the board has denied Germany its traditional captive market, forcing it to look beyond Europe for external markets to sustain export-led growth. For Southern Europe, the only remaining option is investment-led growth, but the debt crisis prevents Southern European governments from raising the necessary funds themselves. The only source of such investment is now Northern Europe, with the primary mode of financial transfer being bailout packages designed to manage Southern European debt rather than actually invest in the productivity of Southern European systems. All of this means that these countries can only support their current systems so long as German largesse continues. The Germans may be reluctantly willing to fund bailout after bailout to keep the Union together, but their ability to subsidize the continent is not endless. The Germans, too, are aging. As of 2014, the German population bulge is in its early 50s, at the height of its technical skill and taxpaying capability. That's making German tax coffers flush with cash and allowing the German export machine to outcompete nearly everyone on not just the European, but also the global stage. Fast forward a decade, however, and this cadre will be retiring en masse and drawing pensions. German competitiveness, German exports, and above all the German government's ability to fund the never-ending bailout of the European Union will evaporate. The Europe of today is at the high point of a system that is now in a period of permanent shrinkage. Between banking dysfunction and aging demographics, credit will never be as accessible in Europe as it is now, and growth will never be as strong as it is now. Germany's ability to generate growth from exporting goods within the European system has ended. Even assuming that the Europeans solve all of their political and financial problems, only the Germans can afford the bill to keep Europe together economically, and they can only afford that for, at most, another 10 years. Even if the Europeans can save their banks and the Euro, even if the French and Germans can come to an amicable and productive meeting of the minds on how the Union should be run, they are still staring down the maw of demographic obsolescence and they are doing so at a time when the rest of the world still boasts a relatively young demography. The Europeans can look to Japan, with its collapsing finances, hollowing out industries and ever-mounting debt levels, to get an idea of what the approaching financial self-immolation will feel like. Luckily, there is one bright spot in all of this. As Europe slouches into Japanese-style demographic and financial malaise, it is simultaneously retreating from the global system. 
Japan's banks are so insolvent that all have already withdrawn from the international system. Europe is now following suit. With European financial involvement in everything from investment in East Asia to trade finance becoming an ever less European affair. As Europe's crisis worsens and spreads, it is inadvertently fencing itself off from the international system. When the European system does finally snap, it probably won't be taking the rest of us with it. Problem 5. Germany in Crisis The two world wars did not so much confirm Germans' aggressiveness as it confirmed their desperation. Germany is too exposed to rivals at most points of the compass. No matter how successful the Germans may be in prosecuting a war in one direction, they simply lack the numbers to be successful in all of them. The only way Germany can compete is to be better than its neighbors. Better education, faster financing, higher levels of efficiency, more productive workforce, more advanced industrial base, better infrastructure. This certainly allows them to prevail in struggles against any of their rivals, but it has never enabled them to prevail against all of them. Invariably, German success breeds ever larger and more powerful anti-German coalitions that eventually overpower it. Unless, of course, someone changes the rules of the game. That is precisely what the Americans did with Bretton Woods. The Americans granted the Germans access to all of the raw materials and markets they could ever need. The Americans also incorporated the Germans into an alliance network in which their neighbors were actually helping to defend Germany instead of threatening or resisting it. In a complete geopolitical flip, Germany's rivals turned alliance partners had become economic partners as well. But the Germans didn't stop being hyper-efficient. All of their organization and energy was now wholly focused on their industrial base and export industries. Bretton Woods didn't just allow for the end of European violence and the formation of the European Union, it also created a platform from which German economic and financial power would prove unassailable. Unable to compete with a Germany that was not weighed down by egregious defense costs, Countries as varied as the United Kingdom, France, Spain, and Greece saw their economies steadily hollowed out by superior German industrial output. And in the post-Cold War era, German life got even better. NATO expanded to the former Soviet republics, ending Germany's status as a border state. Reunification injected 16 million low-cost but still highly skilled East Germans into the West German system. That's kept a lid on labor inflation one of the perennial bugaboos of Germany's high-skilled labor economic model. Even the European financial crisis has helped. Lumping straggling countries like Italy, crisis countries like Ireland, and dysfunctional countries like Greece in with hyper-efficient Germany has put substantial downward pressure on the euro. German exports can outcompete almost anyone, anywhere. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Without the Americans imposing and guaranteeing Bretton Woods, there will be no NATO and no global economic trade network. The 32% share of German exports that requires open sea lanes and American largesse represents 16% of German GDP. A greater relative portion than all American trade with the entire world. The remaining 68% of German exports, over one-third of German GDP, just shy of $1 trillion, is not immediately in danger as they are sold to countries either within the European Union or physically close neighbors such as Switzerland, Norway, Ukraine, and Russia. But there is nothing to say that these exports will be secure or stable. Bretton Woods granted market access and physical security guarantees and made the peaceful evolution of the European Union possible. As each beneficiary has different security and economic needs, each will respond to the American withdrawal differently particularly as a considerable list of European countries perceived the American security guarantees as guaranteeing their security from Germany. For nearly all EU members, the Germans are now far and away their largest source of imports. In a world in which their extra-European exports are suddenly in danger, this quickly escalates from a niggling political issue to a catastrophic economic one. Living in a world in which German industry dominates your economic life is one thing, but waking up to discover that the Americans are no longer holding the Germans in check is quite another. Perhaps Germany's biggest problem will be there is no single place, or even five places, that the Germans need access to if they are to survive. Courtesy of Bretton Woods, the economic geography of early 21st century Europe is far more entangled than that of any other age of German independence. 
The most accessible energy production sites are nearly 2,000 miles away, either in Azerbaijan or northwestern Russia. And Germany needs 2.2 million barrels of crude imports daily. As far as raw materials are concerned, everything from aluminum to iron ore is no longer even produced in Europe, which is long since mined out. German supply chains are no longer exclusively nationally held, but are instead dependent upon intermediate inputs and even finishing work in Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria, Poland, and the Czech Republic. This all makes Germany sound like a dependent has-been, doesn't it? But this is Germany. And German organizational acumen and efficiency are not limited to industrial policy. When sufficiently motivated, the Germans are capable of transformations that are as startling as they are rapid. An end to Bretton Woods provides the motivation. Every country that chooses to restrict trade access will be one that the Germans will have to consider both a competitor for now restricted supplies of raw materials and a now denied end market. That might sound innocuous enough. But consider that such concerns were the driving rationale behind the last six wars the Germans initiated. World War II, World War I, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, the Austro-Prussian War of 1866, and the Schleswig Wars of 1848-51 and 1864. Germany may not have much of a military at the present, but neither did it in 1935 just five years before it conquered eight of the nine countries that it currently borders. This isn't Uzbekistan or Japan, where the requirements are nearby so the path is obvious. This isn't Saudi Arabia or Iran, where the threats and so the necessary steps to counter them are clear. Without Bretton Woods, Germany's mere existence is a threat to the very neighbors that Germany needs if it is to continue as a successful country. And under Bretton Woods, the German economy has grown so much that even a deal with all of them still wouldn't give Germany the energy, resources, and markets it needs. Without the Americans, Germany's economic crisis quickly escalates to a European-wide strategic crisis, where the paths and outcomes are clear to no one. The only certain variable is that the Germans will not lie down and die. For the fourth time in the past 150 years, they will challenge the European status quo. Only time will tell if they will shatter it. The Europeans have two neighbors, Turkey and Russia, who are likely to ramp up their pressure on the European periphery in the next decade. For the past decade, a slowly awakening Turkey has played in the Middle Eastern sandbox. And it has discovered that the Middle East is full of intractable issues, bad blood, and above all else, lack of economic benefit. The countries of North Africa, the Levant, and Iraq combined have a smaller combined economic footprint than Spain, a mid-sized European economy. The Middle East is not Turkey's future. Historically, the old Ottoman economic and intellectual heartland wasn't in the Middle East or even in Anatolia. It was in the Balkans, and that's where its future will be as well. Currently, two things are holding the Turks back from this path. First, the current regime is new having been in government for only a decade. They are still learning what works and what doesn't, and most of all, why. Second, NATO and the EU dominate the Balkans, with Slovenia, Greece, Croatia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria all full members of both organizations. So long as the American security umbrella remains functionally in place, and so long as the EU continues existing in its current form, the Turks face limitations in what they can do to their northwest. Both of those barriers exist on borrowed time. The EU is likely to devolve, in the best case scenario, into more of a glorified free trade zone, but not one with any pretensions to a common foreign or security policy. As for the Americans, their falling interest in the world writ large is something the Turks will be able to scrutinize closely. Turkey is a NATO member. Ankara will be able to detect precisely when the alliance's security guarantees devolve from relevance to mere words on a page. The only question is timing. Russia, by contrast, faces no political or alliance constraints on its ability to pursue a strategic policy to its west. However, unlike Turkey, it does face a time pressure. Russia's demographics are so horrid that if it fails to act before 2022, it will lose the capacity to act both militarily and economically. This puts Russia on a collision course with the eight EU members on the edge of what the Russians see as their preferred border zone. Finland? 
Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. It would seem that the Russian challenge to Europe's future is rather obvious. Well, yes and no. Yes, in that Russian pressure on places like Ukraine is both palpable and increasing. Yes, in that the emotional state of these eight European countries ranges from intense concern to panicked paranoia at the rising Russian tide. And yes, in that should Russia follow a piecemeal approach, it can encroach upon Europe's eastern borders without unduly provoking Western Europe's heavyweights. No, in that the reactions of some of these countries to Russian encroachment may be even more injurious to the concept of European unity than the Russians themselves. As the country where the North European plain transitions into the Eurasian hordelands, Poland will decide Russia's success in re-anchoring between the Baltic Sea and the Carpathians. The Poles realize what is at stake and have been taking steps toward a plan for several years. Poland, as Central Europe's largest industrial power and with its largest population, sees itself as the natural leader of the former Soviet satellites who joined the EU and NATO in the 1990s and 2000s. There is more than a small credence to that claim, but the crew that Poland seeks to lead is a motley one. Even after a quarter century of effort, the region's infrastructure is remarkably fractured. The Baltic states have far better links to Russia, a holdover of the Soviet era, than they do to one another or the Western European region. Romania and Bulgaria are south of the Carpathians and have but one four-lane road that links them to the rest of Europe and only two bridges that connect them across the Danube the second of which was only completed in 2013. Slovakia is mountainous. Hungary is really only linked to Austria, and even that connection is pinched by the Vienna Gap. Poland, somewhat ironically, has the best infrastructure linkages of the lot, but those connections are largely due to its position on the North European plain, which in turn ties it directly to both Germany and Russia, the two powers that Warsaw is most concerned about. Making matters worse, nearly all of the former satellites are dependent upon the Russians for both oil and natural gas. An alliance of the Intermarium, the countries between the Baltic and the Black Seas, simply isn't workable. Merely coordinating the actions of such disconnected geographies and heterogeneous cultures would be an endeavor attempted only out of sheer desperation. Without some far more powerful entity, say a rejuvenated European Union or an engaged United States, actively managing such a gangly alliance, the Russians would have a fairly easy time engaging and defeating each of the Intermarium states in sequence and in isolation. That is, with the possible exception of Poland. Despite Poland's largely indefensible position, and despite its potential need to defend against both Germany and Russia, the Poles have a Swedish ace up their sleeve. Since being forced into strategic neutrality at the conclusion of the Great Northern War of 1700 to 1721, Sweden gradually became Europe's forgotten power. While technically a continental power, Sweden boasts water to its south and east, mountains to its west, and Tagai and tundra to its north. By most definitions, Sweden operates as a naval power rather than a land power, and as such its military and economic strategies emphasize speed and reach but they do so in a manner somewhat different from other naval powers. Oceanic-oriented cultures like England and Japan were made famous because they became experts harnessing the wind to cover vast distances over open seas. Their vessels were notable for their relatively small crews, the wind did most of the work, and relatively large cargo areas. Lots of supplies were needed to keep the crew alive on long voyages, and lots of trade goods were needed to justify the trip in the first place. With large, manpower light vessels, the British needed to interact with the locals right on the coast. They could rarely afford to penetrate inland with the men they brought, and any such excursion would have to occur on foot. Their boats, whose propulsion was limited by the whim of the wind and the depth of the water, could not easily or reliably sail on rivers. The result was an empire built on indirect rule and coastal trading depots. Early Sweden's approach was considerably different, because Sweden's regional geography was considerably different. The Danish island of Zealand kept the Swedish Vikings and later the Swedish Empire locked in the Baltic, a very small place compared with the oceans. There was no need for the Swedes to learn to sail when they could simply row. Instead of huge, wind-powered vessels with small crews, the Swedes used small, oar-powered vessels with large crews. The more men, the faster the vessel could go. Short trips meant less need for supplies. Whereas the British made landfall with small, scrawny, scurvy-ridden landing parties eager to trade, 
the Vikings made landfall with large, strapping warriors eager to satisfy more basic instincts. Because longboats have such shallow drafts, and because they were manned by lots of brawny Vikings, they could easily be rowed upriver and even portaged. Unique among the naval powers, the Swedes punched deep inland, and even showed up as far away as Constantinople from time to time. This more direct approach is still reflected in Swedish strategy. Its military remains remarkably amphibious, and its defense industry depends upon no external power. Its economic relationships are direct and deep, seeking full ownership, in contrast to the Anglo preference of involvement via minority share purchases. But Sweden remains undeniably maritime, valuing trade and financial connections over the hardwired infrastructure and military links of land-based powers. Even now, three centuries after Sweden's grand defeat in the Great Northern War and its banishment to neutrality, the Baltic Sea remains a Swedish lake. Much of the world has forgotten this, but not Sweden's neighbors, because they were first raiding targets, then part of the Swedish Empire, and now part of the extended Swedish family, literally. Another culture that hasn't forgotten are the Russians, whose rivers are not particularly amenable to traditional maritime transport, but were perfect for the Viking expeditions of the previous age. The issue for the Russians and Germans isn't that Poland wants to be the brain and muscle of an anti-Russian and maybe anti-German intermarium, but that Sweden has every interest in making sure that the Poles succeed. Like Poland, the Swedes fear undue German or Russian influence regardless of the form it takes. And while Poland might have some difficulty spackling together an alliance, Sweden already has one. The familial relations of Viking and Imperial Sweden do not just include the weaklings of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, but also Finland, Norway, and Denmark. Economically developed, culturally united, militarily robust countries that boast more than enough petroleum to supply everyone in the extended Swedish family, and Poland as well. By any measure, a Swedish-Polish alliance would be a mating of synergies. Sweden is an advanced maritime technocracy, while Poland is a modernizing land-based industrial power. Sweden has the money and technology needed to make Poland bloom, and Poland has the market to make it worth Sweden's while. And neither are in the Eurozone, so at least part of the European carnage to come will pass them by. Numbers will still prove a problem. 